Good morning, grandkids. You know what today is. Today is the last book of the Wolf Queen series. I am so anxious to read this and find out what happens. And yet, it's the last book. I don't want it to end. I feel just like I did when we was reading uh, Joseph Russell's uh, The Lost World book. I don't want it to end. Let's see what's happening. This is in the third era in the year 127. Following the battle of, is that icky dag? <laughs> it looks so weird. The, the Emperor Uriel Septim III was captured and before he was able to be brought to his uncle's castle in the Hammerfell Kingdom of Gilane, he met his death at the hands of an angry mob. His uncle, Sephorus, Sephorus, was thereafter proclaimed emperor and rode to the imperial city. Now, you know that Polima isn't going to like this. The troops formerly loyal to Emperor Uriel and his mother, the Wolf Queen, Potima, pledged themselves to the new emperor in return for their support, the nobility of Skyrim, High Rock, Hammerfell, the Somerset Isles, Valenwood, Black Marsh, and Morrowind demanded and received a new level of autonomy and independence from the Empire. See, back there where it said formerly loyal to Emperor Uriel and his mother, you know that the Wolf Queen was had strived so hard to get Uriel, her son, to become emperor that she's sort of behind the scenes controlling things. You know that she wanted to be emperor. But there wasn't anything in, in books in between telling us of any intrigue like that going on. And I would have really liked to have known some of the stuff she was up to during that time. But oh well. The War of the Red Diamond was at an end. Potima continued to fight a losing battle. Her area of influence dwindling and dwindling until only her kingdom of solitude remained in her power. Don't you know she's dying over that? She summoned Daedra to fight for her, had her necromancers resurrect her fallen enemies as undead warriors, and mounted attack after attack on the forces of her brothers, the Emperor Sephorus Septim I and King Magnus of Lilma. Her allies began leaving her as her madness grew. Oh God. And her only companions were the zombies and skeletons that she had amassed over the years. Good grief. The kingdom of solitude became a land of death. Stories of the ancient wolf queen being waited on by rotting skeletal chambermaids and holding war plans with vampiric generals terrified her subjects, I guess. In the year 137, Magnus opened up the small window in his room for the first time in weeks. He heard the sounds of a city, carts squeaking, horses clopping over the cobblestones, and somewhere a child laughing. He smiled as he returned to his bedside to wash his face and finish dressing. There was a distinctive knock on the door. Come in, Pell, he said. Pelagius 
bounded into the room. It was obvious that he had been up for hours. Magnus marveled at his energy and wondered how much longer battles would last if they were run by 12-year-old boys. <laughs> Did you see outside yet? Pelagius asked. All the townspeople have come back. There are shops and a mage's guild. And down by the harbor, I saw a hundred ships come in from all over the place. They don't have to be afraid anymore. We've taken care of all the zombies and ghosts that used to be their neighbors, and they know it's safe to come back. They've taken care of all of them. So, but, so between the end of that page and now, they've killed all of her zombies and ghosts and so on. They're skipping too much in writing these books, I think. Is Uncle Sephoris going to turn into a zombie when he dies? Asked Pelagius. Well, I wouldn't put that past him, laughed Magnus. Why do you ask? I heard some people saying that he was old and sick, said Pelagius. He's not that old, said Magnus. He's 60 years old. That's just two years older than I am. And how old is Aunt Fatima? asked Pelagius. Seventy, said Magnus, and yes, that is old. Any more questions, we'll have to wait. I have to go meet with the commander now, but we can talk at supper. You can make yourself busy and not get into trouble. Yes, sir, said Pelagius. He understood that his father had to continue to hold siege on Aunt Potima's castle after they took it over and locked her up. When did they do that? Oh, they haven't. They would move out of the inn and into the castle. Oh, they quite, haven't quite caught her and locked her up yet. Pelagius was not looking forward to that. The whole town had a funny, sweet, dead smell, but he could not get even as close as the castle moat without gagging from the stench. They could dump a million flowers on the place and it wouldn't make any difference at all. He don't want to go live there. He walked through the city for hours, buying some food and then some ribbons for his sister and mother back in Lilma. He thought about who else he needed to buy gifts for and was stumped. All his cousins, the children of Uncle Sephoris, Aunt Uncle Antiochus and Aunt Fatima, had died during the war, some of them in battle, some of them during the famines because so many crops had been burned. Aunt Bianchi had died last year. There was only he, his mother, his sister, his father, and his uncle, the emperor, left, and Aunt Fatima, but she didn't really count. <laughs> when he came upon the mages guild earlier that morning, he had decided not to go in. Those places always spooked him with their strange smoke and crystals and old books. This, this time it occurred to Pelagius that he might buy a gift for Uncle Sephoris, a souvenir of Solitude's Mages Guild. An old woman was having trouble with the front door, so Pelagius opened it for her. Thank you, she said. She was easily the oldest thing he thing. <laughs> she was easily the oldest thing he had ever seen. Her face looked like an old rotted apple, oh my god, framed with a wild whirl of bright white hair. He instinctively moved away from her gnarled talon when she started to pat him on the head. But there was a gem around her neck that immediately fascinated him. It was a single bright yellow jewel, but it almost looked, they left out like, I think, but it almost looked like there was something trapped within. When the light hit it from the candles, it brought out the form of a four-legged beast pacing. Whoa, she's got something trapped in there. It's a soul gem, she said 
infused with the spirit of a great demon werewolf. It was enchanted long, long ago with the power to charm people, but I've been thinking about giving it another spell. Uh-oh. Perhaps something from the school of alteration, like lock or shield. She paused and looked at the boy carefully with yellow, dreamy eyes. You look familiar to me, boy. What's your name? Pelagius, he said. He normally would have said Prince Pelagius, but he was told not to draw attention to himself while in town. I used to know someone named Pelagius, the old woman said, and slowly smiled. Are you here alone, Pelagius? My father is with the army storming the castle, but he'll be back when the walls have been breached. Which I dare say won't take too much longer, sighed the old woman. Nothing, no matter how well built, tends to last. Are you buying something in the Mages Guild? I wanted to buy a gift for my uncle, said Pelagius, but I don't know if I have enough gold. The old woman lifted the boy to look over the wares while she went, oh, she, she left the boy to look over the wares while she went to the guild enchanter. He was a young Nord, ambitious and new to the kingdom of solitude. It took little persuasion and a lot of gold to convince him to remove the charm spell from the soul gem and imbue it with a powerful curse, a slow poison that would drain wisdom from its wearer year by year until he or she lost all reason. She also purchased a cheap ring of fire resistance. For your kindness to an old woman, I've brought you these, she said, giving the boy the necklace and the ring. Oh my God. You can give the ring to your uncle and tell him it has been enchanted with a levitation spell. So if ever he needs to leap from high places, it will protect him. And that's not what's in there. So he would leap and kill himself. The soul gem is for you. Thank you, said the boy, but this is too kind of you. Oh, kindness has nothing to do with it, she answered quite honestly. You see, I was in the Hall of Records at the Imperial Palace once or twice, and I read about you in the foretellings of the Elder Scrolls. Really? You will be emperor one day, my boy, the Emperor Pelagius Septim III. And with this soul gem to guide you, posterity will always remember you and your deeds. Yeah, because he'll go mad. With those words, the old woman disappeared down an alley behind the mage's skill. Pelagius looked after her, but he did not think to search behind a heap of stones. If he had, he would have found a tunnel under the city into the heart of Castle Solitude. And if he had found his way there, he would have found past the shambling, undead, and the moldering remains of a once grand palace, the bedroom of the queen. In that bedroom, he would find the wolf queen of solitude in repose, listening to the sounds of her castle collapsing, and he would see a toothless grin growing on her face as she breathed her last. The Wolf Queen, at 70, she toothless, she didn't take any better care of herself than that, and she breathed her last, this is from the pen of Isolicus, second century sage. Third area era 137. 
Hotima Septim died after a month-long siege on her castle. While she lived, she had been the Wolf Queen of Solitude, daughter of the Emperor Pelagius II, wife of King Mantiarco, aunt of the Empress Kintyra II, mother of Emperor Uriel III, and since sister of the Emperors Antiochus and Sephorus. At her death, Magnus appointed his son, Pelagius, that's his boy, as the titular head of Solitude under guidance from the Royal Council. Third Era, Year 140. The Emperor Sephorus Septim died after falling from his horse. His brother was proclaimed the Emperor Magnus Septim. The next year, 141, Pelagius, king of solitude, is recorded as occasionally eccentric in the imperial annals. He marries Kateria, Duchess of Bardenfeld, and in 145, the Emperor Magnus Septim dies. His son, who will be known as Pelagius the Mad, is coronated. Good grief. And that's the end, guys. So that's how the, come the Emperor Magnus Septim died. So he gave the necklace to, to Sephorus, and he fell and died. And he has the soul gem necklace oh, that made him go mad. So that's why he became Pelagius the Mad when he was coronated. How weird. And Potema is dead. But now, let me ask you a question, because I really don't pay too much attention to lore when I'm playing the games. I just, I just play around in Skyrim, make up stories, look at the landscape, <laughs> take pictures. <laughs> so I know there's this quest, a Wolf Queen quest, and I've been there and I've done it, but it it's been a while back and I don't remember very much about it. I don't know, I don't remember if it was to release her or to trap her. But here she's dead, so what is she there in that quest? I, I'm going to have to search that out in my big Skyrim Bible and uh, see what that quest is about, I guess. So this is the end of this book. And uh, next Friday, I wanted to read. Uh, I want to read the Thief, and then the book that comes after that, The Warrior. So uh, I want to start with the Thief instead of the Beggar because the Beggar is when he was a kid, and and I'm not as interested in that. And I want to I want to know what happens. After, after he grows up a little bit. So I'm going to start with The Thief and then read The Warrior, okay? So I'll see you next week. I don't know if this was a satisfying ending or not. I think they skipped a lot of things that they could have made very interesting in a book or two in between here. So, But it is what it is, kids, right? So this was the end, and I will see you next week with a new story. So bye-bye, grandkids.